For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. When you take time to read the Greek, you'll see that it's not quite what the original text says. Unfortunately, that's one of the problems that we have when we translate it. It's very difficult to translate it word for word. It'd, it'd be a little bit hard to understand. And so whilst it's not quite what the original text says, as far as translations go, it's actually not too bad. In any case, what the Apostle Paul means is this. What we presently see And therefore what you and I see, as far as the full expression of God's kingdom stands, the the power of the age to come, of everything yet to be revealed, it isn't perfectly clear. That's what Paul is saying. It isn't perfectly clear. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And it's not just a problem that is peculiar to the church in Corinth either. No church, no church and no Christian for that matter, sees all that God is preparing for them and even through them clearly. We see only a reflection. And that includes, by the way, the Apostle Paul, what we see says Paul. Not not what you see. Paul's not having a go at the Corinthian church in this respect. He he says what what we see is only a reflection. Not even Paul sees clearly. Now, if you ever find a Christian who can answer every question that you have concerning the kingdom of heaven, think about that. Think about what it is that Paul has, has just said and be very, very wary Whilst ever we live between the now and when Jesus returns, church, what we see, says Paul, what you see and what what I see, what we see is only a reflection. We have to be content to live with questions. Christians have to be content to live with, with questions. In other words, it's okay to say, I don't know. I'll have um, congregants come to me, they'll want to speak to me about a problem and they'll knock on the door and they'll come in and they'll lay the problem at my feet. And more often than not, their pastor says to them, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer for the question that you've brought to me. How about we pray about it? And sometimes that's not very satisfying to hear that, but, but that is the reality. That, that's where we're at. Sometimes we have to live with questions. Why? Because we don't know all the answers. There is just so much that we don't yet know. And because I don't know, what is it then that I do? I place myself in the hands of the one who does know. Because I don't know and he does know, I place myself in in his hands. Do, do, Do you see? It's the best place for God's people to be. We don't have all the answers. God has all the answers. And so what is it that God's people are to do? We, we place ourselves willingly and knowingly in his hands. And just to bring the point home, Paul changes the analogy in the second half of verse 12 from seeing to knowing. First half of verse 12, what we see isn't clear. Second half of verse 12, we don't yet know all there is to know. Two quite different expressions, both pointing to the same truth. We don't see, we don't know. We don't see, we don't know. Not not yet, we don't. Not not completely, we don't. Not, Not clearly. Actually, Paul makes the second half of verse 12 personal. I know in part. That's what Paul writes. I know in part. And so if the Apostle Paul's understanding is partial, what does it say about their understanding? 
If his understanding is partial, what does it say about their understanding of those he's writing to? At the very least, Paul is reminding them that there is still a great deal that they, they don't know. There is still a great deal he's writing to them that they don't actually see. And it's just one of the reasons why humility is so important. There's always more to learn. We, we, we never stop growing. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Let me ask you a question. It's a rhetorical question, so I'm not asking you to sit down with the person sitting next to you and have a discussion, but um, answer it in your own head. As a rule, do you shower in the morning or do you shower in the evening? So I'm not asking the morning showers to sit over there and the evening showers to sit over there, but as a rule, you know. You know, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm generally a morning person. Now, it just so happens that when I have a shower, I sometimes forget to turn on the exhaust fan. Any of you ever do that? I'm, I'm in such a hurry to, to wipe the sleepies away from my eyes and to start the day that I step into the shower and I turn the water on. I can't be bothered turning it off and going and putting the fan on, so I have a, have a shower without having put the exhaust fan on. And when I do that, it creates a bit of a problem. I step out of the shower, I dry myself off, and, and when I look in the mirror to brush my hair, perhaps, what I hope to see, I don't see. I don't see it because the mirror's all steamed up. Now, sometimes I'll wipe the mirror with a face washer, and when I do that, the, the image becomes a little clearer. It's, it's, not, it's not completely clear, as when I put the exhaust fan on, but it's a little bit better. And sometimes I focus just on that part of the mirror where the steam hasn't yet settled. Usually it's along the bottom of the mirror or in the, on the corners. Are you with me? Those of you, yeah, okay, good. Some of you are nodding, are nodding your head. That's, that's what I do. And even when I do that, all I see is a fraction of what I would otherwise see. It's not the whole image I see, it's just a part of it. And so what do I do? Well, what I do is I, I focus, when I'm, when I'm looking at that part of the mirror that isn't steamed up, I, I focus only on what I can see. And so I either wipe the mirror with a face washer or I don't wipe the mirror with a face washer and I focus only on what I can see. Why? Because everywhere else that I'm looking is blurred. I can't see anything. Now, when Paul says we see only a reflection, it's a bit like me stepping out of the shower having forgot to turn on the exhaust fan. The very best that I can see, the very best that I can see is only a dim, only a faint reflection of what I hope to see. It's only a dim reflection. And what the church in Corinth saw, even with all of its spiritual gifts, was only a dim, only a very faint reflection of the full expression of the kingdom of God. That's all they saw. Now just stop for a moment and think about that. What do you expect to see when you come to church? Think about what it is that Paul has just said. What do you expect to see when you come to church? We all have expectations, don't we? What are yours? What do you expect to see? What should you see? What do you see? What do you expect to see? What should you see? What do you see? Now, regardless of what you expect to see, what you won't see when you come to church is a full expression of the kingdom of God. What you won't see, even if you expect to see it, is a full expression of God's kingdom. What you should see when you bring yourself to church is a faint image. That's what you should see. Just like looking in a mirror, a mirror that's all steamed up. What you should see as you bring yourself to church is an outline of something that is really, really good. That's what you should see. 
But even then, it won't be clear. It'll be a, it'll be a faint outline. It'll be a, a dim outline. That's all you'll see. And so you'll see worship, you'll, you'll even enter into worship and you'll, and you'll see worshippers, but, but at some point, it's going to fall flat. Even our worship will, from time to time, get lost in self-interest. Is that not true? We find ourselves criticising those who lead worship. Because it's not this way, or it's not that way, or the person sitting beside us, because they're holding up their hands, or they're keeping their hands beside their side. Somewhere along the line, it, it falls flat. You'll see signs of God's presence, but even that will be hidden behind stuff that shouldn't be there. The week's disappointments, the, the nagging regret that you haven't been able to put behind you. You'll see signs of forgiveness, but you'll also see grudges that won't budge. Grudges, perhaps, even that you've brought with you. You'll hear God's word being preached, but but even that will sometimes miss the mark. You'll go excited because the preacher is preaching a passage that you really want to hear. And what was that all about? Perhaps even more often than not, he'll miss the mark. Once in a while, it'll be powerful and God's spirit will move you. But, but most of the time, the truth is, church, most of the time, well, it won't. Because this is God's house. You come expecting to see God, right? Is that not true? This is God's house. You come expecting to see God. Instead, what do you see? You see only a faint image. And Paul says, that's all you will see. Now, why is that? Well, one of the reasons why that is, is for the reason that Rod spoke of a little bit earlier. We're not there yet. That's one of the reasons why it'll be a faint image. We're not there yet. We're still in the world. And the world has a habit of getting in the way. We get in the way. You and I, we're still influenced, aren't we, by the world. Every time we come into church, we, whether we like it or not, whether it's intentional or not, we bring with us a little bit of the world. And you multiply that by everyone else in the church. They bring a little bit of the world in with them too. We're still in the world. And so if you find yourself looking for the perfect church, you will never find it. And almost certainly... If you're looking for the perfect church, you'll never settle. If you're looking for the perfect church. Beaky is not the perfect church. Neither is the church down the road that way. Or the church down the road that way. And more importantly still, if you're looking for the perfect church, you will probably never serve. Why serve in a place that doesn't meet your expectations why do that it's not the perfect church it doesn't meet my expectations and so rather than serve you'll sit it's not what you want to see but it is what you'll see a faint reflection of the kingdom of god and it's not that what you want to see you shouldn't want to see it's just, says Paul, you, you can't see it. Not yet. You can't see it and, and, and you won't see it. And if you expect to see it, if you expect to see it, you'll be disappointed. You know why some people stay at a particular church for a year or, or two years or even three years and then move on? Often it's for that very reason. Often it's for that very reason. They're looking for something that they just will not find. You see, this side of eternity, you will not find what you're looking for. If that's what you're looking for. Keith Green. Any Keith Green lovers here? What a great musician. You younger folk, Google Keith Green. Listen to some of his music. 
You can run to the end of the highway and you will not find what you're looking for. He was right. He was spot on. doesn't matter which church you pop your head into. You will not find what you're looking for. You won't find it. Why not? Because all you can ever see is a dim reflection, a faint outline. That's all you'll ever see. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And it's not a clear reflection either. Now, there, there will be moments when clarity does come. We see one such moment, don't we, in Acts chapter 2, a church filled with awe at what God has done and the privilege that they now have to be called his people. And it affected everything that this brand new church did. Even for us, there will be moments just like that, even for us. But even then, it won't take too long before reality sets in and we see Acts chapter 6 all over again. The Jews and the Greeks beginning to squabble. Or even worse, perhaps, we'll have a couple like Ananias and Sapphira decide to become members. That's what we'll have. And everything that we thought we saw. And perhaps even everything we did see begins to fade just a little. Or worse still, it, it begins to unravel. Paul understands that. And he needs the church in Corinth to understand that. And so what should you and I see when we step into a local church? When we step into this church, what we should see is a faint reflection of the kingdom of God. That's what we should see. We should see a faint reflection of the kingdom of God. And, and when you understand that, you'll go a long way to avoiding the kind of disappointment that caused too many Christians to, to hop from one church to another. You know that, that, that puffed up view of themselves? Well, I can't worship here. Not in this church. We see it all the time. Now, there are some things that churches can do and Christians can do in order to see a bit more clearly. We'll never see completely clearly, not this side of eternity, no matter what we do, but there are some things that we should do and there are some things that we, that we must do so that what we do see isn't obscured any more than it already is. There was something, for instance, that the church in Corinth didn't do, something that they should have done. And there was something that the church in Corinth did do that they shouldn't have done. What they should have done but didn't do, Paul addresses throughout the letter. And you have to read the whole letter to see what that is. Now this evening we're not going to read the whole letter, but I'll show you what it is. What they should have done but they failed to do. What the church in Corinth should have done but they failed to do was address unrepentant sin. You see, unrepentant sin also muddies the image, doesn't it? And, and so what they should have done is address all of those things that had crept into the church rather than ignore them. And yet that's precisely what they did. A bit like picking up a face washer and giving the mirror a wipe. You wipe it, and although it's still not clear, it's not as dim either. It's not as murky. Not now that you've wiped it. It's not as cloudy anymore. Why not? Because you've wiped it. And so what were they? What were those things that the Corinthian church should have wiped away, but they didn't wipe away? What should the Corinthian church have taken steps to intentionally address, but they failed to? What didn't they wipe away? Let me list for you just five problems that they didn't deal with. Number one, there were divisions among them. We read as much, don't we, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 18. In the first place, writes Paul, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it factions in the church this group above that group why can't they be more like us why can't he be more like me factions in the church 
No one in the church was prepared to address it. And the question I have is this, where were the elders? Where were the elders? That's your job, Stephen. That's your job, Glenn. Before it's anyone else's job, that's your job, Rod. To address unrepentant sin. Rather than wipe it away, they let it sit there. They let it fester. And so that was the first problem. And if that wasn't bad enough, there were Christians in the church who paraded their gifts as a form of one-upmanship. For some Christians, at least, speaking in tongues was a cause for spiritual pride. And we'll speak a little bit more about that in just a moment. That was the second problem. What then was the third problem? Well, at least one Christian in the church was suing another Christian in court. And the language that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 suggests that there were multiple parties involved. This was a free-for-all. Everyone was doing it. Now, whatever the reason, the very nature of it, that it's spilled out into the community outside the church reveals a very serious, unresolved problem. And not only that, it served to undermine the integrity and the power of the gospel. And isn't that what we're about? The gospel? Isn't that what we're supposed to take out into the world? The gospel? Not our dirty laundry. The gospel. What did such behaviour say to unbelievers? Where was their witness? Then there was the problem with communion. When the church in Corinth gathered to break bread, it was not uncommon for some in the church to be excluded. Some in the church, they didn't get to share communion. They were, they were left out. There were at least some in the church who thought nothing about proceeding without their brothers and sisters. Now, what did I say this morning? I said one of the things that is really important for Christians to do is to wait. It's the best thing that Christians can do. When you find yourself in a situation that isn't working, what do you do? You wait. You don't have the answers, but God has the answers, and so what do you do? You, you wait. And here in the church in Corinth, it was okay not to wait. It was okay just to rush ahead. I haven't even mentioned the problem of sexual impurity. Gross sexual immorality in the church simply went unaddressed and unpunished. People, it seems, in Corinth were happy to, to look the other way. And what I've given to you just then is five unresolved problems. And church, they're just a few of the problems. There are a whole lot of problems in the church. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Even without these problems, the full glory of God's kingdom is blurred. But these problems, in fact, any problem in the church, they serve to obscure it even more. Not all was bad, though. Not everything about the kingdom was blurred. Some things in the Corinthian church were, were really very visible. The church in Corinth was established by Paul at around 50 or 51 AD as he set off on his first missionary journey. Paul's first letter, the letter that we refer to as 1 Corinthians, was written at around 53 or 54 AD. Now, even I can do the math. I'm not a very good math student, but even I can work that out. This was a church that was no more than four years old. And sometimes we forget that, don't we? We read about the letters that, the, that Paul wrote to the early church. We don't think of how old or how young these churches were. This church was no more than four years old, at the most. Not very old at all. Even so, it was a church that boasted some pretty impressive spiritual gifts. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, words of knowledge, just to name a few. Now think about that. God gave to them, not everyone, but he gave to quite a few in the church, a brand new spiritual language. God hasn't given that to me. But in the church in Corinth, he gave that to a whole lot of Christians. And God spoke to them through prophetic utterances. They even received words of knowledge. You want to hear God? Do you want to experience God? That maybe was the questions being asked in 
first century Corinth. Do you want to hear God? In a city filled with temples, at least 35 temples. Anyone been to Corinth? Magnificent. 35, at least, temples. Magnificent structures. And where does God dwell? Where does God dwell? God dwells in an insignificant Christian church of perhaps 40 to maybe 150 people, probably somewhere in between. A very significant house church at best. That's where God dwells. 35 temples. And where does God dwell? In about as insignificant house church as you'd want to find. That's where God dwells. And so that's the scene. And so let me ask you, what, if any, was the danger? Well, perhaps the biggest danger was pride. That was the biggest danger that they faced, spiritual pride. The thought that they'd arrived. God speaks to us. And you know what? He's even given to us a spiritual language that we can speak to him. That's impressive. That's impressive. And they looked at their spiritual gifts and they thought they had it all. At least some in the church coveted them. And it wasn't that the gifts that they were given weren't good. Every gift given by God is good. But there was a problem. The gifts church became the focus. That's the problem. The gifts themselves became the focus. The one thing that was clear, that God really was present and that he was doing a work in their midst, was seen clearly and unequivocally in these gifts. This, it seems, more and more was their focus. And it puffed them up, so much so that they began to lose sight of what really mattered. And Paul reminds them. We get a hint of the problem in verse 8. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, words of knowledge, it will pass away. So here is a church that God has blessed by giving her certain gifts. And of particular mention were the gifts of prophecy and of tongues and of knowledge. They weren't the only gifts that they received, but these gifts stood out. And at some point, we don't know quite when it was, but, it, but at some point, these gifts took on a life of their own. Now this tells us that the Corinthian church was a very spiritual church, but it was a spiritual church that lost sight of the gospel. It was a spiritual church that lost sight of the gospel. No longer were they serving one another. No longer were they ministering to one another. No longer were they loving one another. All the while, Jesus was being pushed to the margins, replaced instead by signs and wonders, prophecy, tongues and knowledge. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. In other words, even though the full expression of God's kingdom, writes Paul, isn't clear, what we don't need, what we don't need is an added layer of obstructions. That's what we don't need. When we see them, we need to wipe them away. What are some of the things that they needed to wipe away but they didn't? Divisions, grudges. Sexual immorality, spiritual one-upmanship. And Paul says, address them. Wipe them away. Stephen, Glenn, Rod. That's a big responsibility. You need to have eyes wide open. It's not only the good things, it's the bad things. The things that you need to take a, a face washer to. It's already dim. It's already faint. We need to make it just a little bit, little bit clearer. We need to wipe them away. 
But what we also don't need is an unhealthy focus on any one thing at the expense of everything else. What they were focused on, the Corinthian church's focus, was on spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts had blurred their eyes to the important place of love. What they saw and what they focused on had developed a life of its own. Now listen, churches often focus on something or some things, and we need to be mindful of that. I was involved in a church. you know what split the church? They were focused on shoeboxes. They were focused on shoeboxes. You know Samaritan's Purse? And it split the church. Those who wanted to and those who didn't. And I sat there and I thought, what on earth is going on here? Where is love? Churches fail all the time when we focus on things that we shouldn't focus on. And what the Corinthian church was focused on had developed a life of its own. And so this is what the Corinthian church did do but shouldn't have done. Their focus was far too narrow. Their gifts had become far too important. As a result, love had been pushed to the side. This then is what Paul wants them to rediscover. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. You won't see everything. I don't know what you expect to see, but what you won't see is a full expression of the kingdom of heaven. You won't see everything. But what you should see, writes Paul, what you should see is love. That's about as clear an expression of the kingdom of God as you'll ever see. And so let me ask you, What is it that you see? Where's your focus? And not only what is it that you see, what is your practice? What is it it that you practice? If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. In any local church, including here, you will not see the full expression of the kingdom of God. And if you expect to see it, you will walk away disappointed. If that's what you expect to see. You may even become disillusioned. I've got no time for the church anymore. How many people have said that? Because what they've expected to see, they haven't seen. And where does the fault lay? It lays with them. Their expectations were far too lofty. We're living in the now, but not yet. And so what should you see? And just as importantly, what should you bring The clearest expression of the kingdom of God between now and when Jesus returns, writes Paul, is what? Love. That's the clearest expression. You want to see the kingdom of God most clearly? Begin to love the way that God loves you. Love one another. And don't just look for it. Be prepared to bring it. Be prepared to express it. Be prepared, church, to give it. Be prepared to practice it. Open your door and pull a chair out from your table. Practice love. God's own love. That is what we should see. And because this is so important, we're going to come back to it at the end of this series, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is absolutely. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you uh, that Paul gives us very clear instructions. Uh, Lord, help us to always be diligent and to, to want to strive to understand what your word is saying to us that we mo- won't make mistakes that we won't have expectations that won't be met, but so that, Lord, we might do that which you have called us and empowered us to do and that we might be a reflection in the world 
of the kingdom of heaven. Continue to speak to us as we worship you. We pray it in Jesus' name.